G'day there, Steve Chadban from Sydney, Australia. Welcome to today's KDigo ISN webinar, where we're going to examine the cardiac assessment of the kidney transplant candidates. Thank you indeed for joining. Today, it's my great pleasure to host this webinar, which will be given by my good friend and colleague, Professor Helen Pilmore from Auckland, New Zealand. Helen, as I am sure you know, is a long-term clinician researcher in the field of cardiac disease in the kidney transplant context. And Helen, together with Bert Kosiski, has recently headed up our group in generating the new KDGO guideline around cardiac assessment of the kidney transplant candidate. That will form the basis of today's talk. It's a controversial area. I'm sure you will find it very interesting. The guidelines are very soon to come out in transplantation and they will be provocative. I hope today's presentation will generate questions from you. If you have any, I would strongly encourage you to please type them in under the questions tab in your control panel. We will have time at the end of Helen's presentation to go through each of those questions in detail. So for now, I would encourage you to sit back, um, relax, and enjoy the presentation from Professor Helen Pilmore on the cardiac assessment of the kidney transplant candidate. Thank you, Helen. Thank you so much, Steve, and many thanks for asking me to participate in this. I have to say, um, presenting the KDGO guidelines is an honour, and being involved with them was an honour also, and... Um, what I'm planning to do today is to talk about cardiac assessment of kidney transplant candidates and um, present some but not all of the guidelines from the cardiac perspective. I hope, as Steve mentioned, that it will generate some discussion um, and some questions, I hope. Thank you very much. So as we all know, uh, patients with renal failure have got a high chance of developing uh, cardiac disease and high mortality. So this is local data from the Australia New Zealand um, Dialysis and Transplant Authority where we also look at all patients who've been on dialysis and transplant. And you can see here that dialysis patients have a very high mortality compared with the green line, which is the general population and this is less so in transplant patients, but nevertheless, patients after kidney transplant have a higher risk of mortality than the general population. This is also seen in uh, the US, and this is USRDS data, where you can see here that transplant patients have a much greater um, survival than patients who are on dialysis who have a very high mortality rate. When we look at what patients are dying from when they're on the transplant list and on dialysis, you can see that in these blue, um, the blue parts of the um, graph, um, patients are predominantly dying from cardiovascular disease. So cardiovascular disease is one of the greatest causes of mortality in patients who are on dialysis. And of course, it's dialysis patients that we are assessing largely for kidney transplantation. So this is what we need to look at. So as I've stated, there's a very high incidence of cardiac disease in patients with end-stage kidney disease. Um, it's often asymptomatic. And so when we're assessing patients for kidney transplantation, what we're wanting to do is assess the presence and extent of cardiac disease and therefore, from that perspective, assess suitability for kidney transplantation and determine the risk and benefits of treatment for, of disease, both in terms of medication and revascularization. And also, we're assessing whether they would be, uh, whether any of these things are required to get them on the kidney transplant list. So, when we're talking about whether patients um, are suitable for kidney uh, transplant, we want to look at their risk of cardiac disease. So this is the PORT study, which we participated in in our group, but which was led by Bert Kosiski. And they looked at about 25,000 patients uh, who were being assessed for kidney transplantation. 
What you can see here is that uh, patients who have a higher risk of major adverse cardiac events had increasing age, they were of male gender, diabetes was an increased risk factor, as was um, previous cardiovascular events and cancer, also obesity and having a longer duration of dialysis. So what you can see here is that patients who um, are male have, say, an age of greater than 65, diabetes, a previous cardiac stent, and a deceased donor kidney transplant would score about 19, which would give them about a 12.5% risk of having some sort of cardiac event after transplantation in the first year. So we do have some good data about which patients are at higher risk. Particularly from the perspective of diabetics, um, this is work that was done uh, by Y Lim from Australia, looking at patients from the ANS data registry and looking at their mortality in terms of whether they had diabetes, no diabetes, or developed uh, diabetes after transplant. And as you can see, looking in the eras, uh, with the earlier eras being in the bold and the more recent eras being in the dashed lines, you can see here patients uh, who don't have diabetes in all eras have a much greater survival than those who have diabetes. And when we look at patients uh, with cardiovas from the perspective of cardiovascular death, you can see here that patients with diabetes as well also have a much greater risk of cardiovascular death than those patients who do not have diabetes. So we're well aware that diabetics are at increased risk. Similarly, patients of older age are at increased risk, which of course makes sense. So age does tend to be in people's algorithms, and you can see here again, this is uh, from Anne's data, that patients on dialysis of increasing age have a much greater risk of death, and a lot of that death is cardiovascular. So age does need to be put into the algorithm, although of course it's not the only thing. So from the perspective of the KDGO guidelines, uh, we made the guidelines that all patients who are being evaluated for kidney transplantation should be evaluated for the presence and severity of cardiac disease with history, examination, and ECG. Now, of course, that's not graded because these have not been looked at in randomized controlled trials. The second guideline was that patients with signs or symptoms of active cardiac disease, and that's things like heart failure, angina, arrhythmias, symptomatic valvular heart disease, should be assessed by a cardiologist and managed according to current cardiac guidelines prior to further consideration for a kidney transplant. As you all know, there's very few trials looking specifically at management of cardiac disease in patients who are on dialysis. And most dialysis patients and severe CKD patients are excluded from cardiac trials. And therefore, it's important that we do look to some degree from the general guidelines of the population. And the cardiac guidelines are often updated and so seeing a cardiologist who is aware of their local guidelines, I think, is important. We suggest that asymptomatic candidates at high risk for coronary disease, for example, people with diabetes, previous coronary artery disease, or with poor functional capacity, undergo non-invasive coronary artery disease screening. And this is graded at 2C um, because there's little in the way of randomised controlled trials in this area, although we do have some data. This is similar to the American Heart Organization recommendations from 2012, where they recommended that non-invasive stress testing may be considered in kidney transplantation candidates without active cardiac conditions based on the presence of greater than three risk factors, and that's regardless of their functional status. So the risk factors that they suggest are diabetes, prior coronary artery disease, a longer duration on dialysis, left ventricular hypertrophy, older age, smoking, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. If you look at which types of cardiac assessment are useful, I think there's some um, data that is 
helpful from that perspective. So this is the uh, a Cochrane review, which Angela Webster's group participated in or uh, undertook, and they looked at which patients, which type of cardiac tests were useful or not. So this top area looked at scintigraphy, the next lot looked at dobutamine stress echoes, and the next lot looked at coronary angiograms, and the relative risks for a positive test being associated with death or death occurring in patients with a positive test was significant in all of these things. So there is a positive test is certainly associated with a higher risk of death. Which test is better to do? So in fact, all of these tests perform reasonably well. And as you can see from another analysis, which was done by Angela's group, having a positive test with any of these tests, angiography, myocardial perfusion, scintigraphy, or DSC, were all statistically similar. So a positive test uh, predicted all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and major adverse cardiac events. Interestingly, though, there is a net false negative rate. So some patients who have a negative test will also die, some will have cardiac mortality, and some will have cardiac events. So you can't be completely reassured by a negative test, although obviously having a positive test is greatly more correlated. So then one of the issues is, should we test everybody? And this is a study that was um, looked at, uh, was published about four years ago by Delima's group, who's done a lot of work in this area. And what they were wanting to look at was, do you actually need to test every patient who wants to get on the kidney transplant list? Or can you look at low-risk patients and not test those people? So they looked at the following risk factors, an age greater than 50, diabetes, and clinical coronary disease. If you had none of those risk factors, patients were considered low risk. They were put on the transplant waiting list and about a third of them got transplanted. Patients with one risk factor had a myocardial perfusion scan. If it was negative, they were just put on the list. If it was positive, they went on to coronary angiography. Patients with two or more risk factors went straight to coronary angiography. Um, if there was a significant stenosis, some of them had intervention and some of them had medical management, and some of those patients were transplanted. This is uh, the graph which looks at what happened to people. And you can see here that this low risk group, which is group three, had a very low event rate. So what they showed was in the group of patients who are at low cardiac risk, there is no obvious need to do a cardiac stress test because these patients uh, did not tend to have events. And so in our guideline, we have put that we should look, we should stratify people according to their risk. And I think it would be reasonable for low risk patients to not have a cardiac stress test. And in fact, that's what we do in our department. Um, we know from the general population that cardiac screening does not in itself reduce events. So this is a study done uh, in diabetic patients. These patients did not have end-stage renal failure, and patients were randomised to screening or no screening. And as you can see from the first graph, there is no difference in cardiac events between those patients who were screened or not screened. And this was a large number of patients. If somebody had a positive stress test, the management was, manda was not mandated and was decided clinically. So what we don't know really is what happened to these patients. But what you can see here is that if you had a normal stress test, which is this line down here, you had a very low risk of cardiac events. Patients who were not screened had a very low risk of cardiac events. If you had a significant abnormality on your myocardial perfusion scan, there was a much higher risk of having a cardiac event. There is a study being done at the moment looking at cardiac screening, which we participated in, and Steve is the lead in Australia for this study. And this is a study being done with Canada, New Zealand, and a number of other countries, including Taiwan and Spain. 
And in this study, which is called the CASC study, patients who are already on the kidney transplant list are randomized in a one-to-one nature to regular cardiac screening or not regular uh, or no cardiac screening um, to see whether there's any difference in major adverse cardiac events. And so the results of this study, I think, will also be very helpful to tell us whether we actually need to do screening or not. However, our current recommendation prior to the results of this study occurring is that in patients who have risk factors, screening is a reasonable thing to do. Um, However, it may be that that, in fact, just tells us who can be listed and who is not suitable to be listed, depending on the number of organs that different countries have available. So if we do a test or a patient has angina and goes on to have a cardiac stress test, what do we do if it's positive? What, how do we treat coronary disease? So firstly, we have recommended that asymptomatic candidates with known coronary disease should not be revascularized, revascularized exclusively to reduce perioperative cardiac events. So this is different to uh, the way some people have been managed in the past, um, and I think this is a little bit contentious, but we believe there is no evidence that you should exclusively revascularise patients for just for transplantation. And I'm going to discuss that in the next few slides. We do, however, suggest that patients with asymptomatic advanced triple vessel coronary disease may need to be excluded from kidney transplantation unless they have an estimated survival which is acceptable according to national standards. So, for example, in New Zealand, where I come from, we um, do not put people on the deceased donor list unless they have an anticipated uh, survival of greater than 80% at five years, and we have an algorithm for calculating that. So in the past, people have revascularised patients specifically to get a kidney transplant. And in fact, a lot of the reason that's done is based on this first paper from Mansky, which as you can see was published many years ago. And what they did in that study was they had 13 patients who were randomised to revascularisation. These were all diabetics, and they had all of these patients had known coronary disease. Another 13 were medically managed. And on the basis of 26 patients with a much lower event rate in the revascularised patients than in the medically treated patients, many people have revascularised patients with coronary disease specifically to get them transplanted. Now, when you read this paper, what they actually state as the outcome is that a larger study needs to be done. And in fact, in this paper, this was prior to uh, the use of statins. Many patients were not on beta blockers, which we know is good for patients with coronary disease. Only about half of them were on aspirin. And there was also a high use of short-acting calcium channel blockers, which we don't tend to use in this day and age. So in fact, I don't believe that this paper is a mandate to revascularise patients with coronary disease to get them on the list. When we look at other patient groups, and this McFall study, the CARP study, uh, looked at patients with severe vascular disease who were hoping to get either an abdominal aortic aneurysm repair or some significant vascular surgical procedure like a femoral popliteal bypass. You can see here that patients uh, who that they were randomised to be revascularised or not to get their surgery, and there was absolutely no difference in outcomes or survival depending on whether they got revascularised or not. The ischemia CKD study, which has not been published as yet, but which I've got permission to show a couple of slides from their website, looked at patients with a GFR of less than 30 or patients who were on dialysis. And in fact, when we wrote the guideline, this study uh, was still underway and the early results hadn't been published, but pleasingly, I think they do seem to fit in with what we've suggested. So this group of patients uh, were randomised to either invasive strategy where they had optimal medical therapy and a coronary angiogram and optimal revascularization if they were suitable or conservative therapy where they were managed just with medical therapy. 
the primary endpoint was a composite of death or myocardial infarction. And as you can see here, there was absolutely no difference in the primary endpoint and the ischemia CKD trial findings, obviously, which have not been published as yet, but I suspect will be the same, so it shows that uh, there is no benefit in heart procedures added to taking me medicines and making lifestyle changes in terms of heart attack or death. Um, obviously, these results, they state, clearly do not apply to people having a heart attack or those with severe chest pain symptoms because these patients were asymptomatic. I think it's also important that we remember that there may be harm uh, with not transplanting patients with coronary disease. So although we do not want to transplant people who are about to have a heart attack or who are likely to die under anesthesia, and we know that patients with severe coronary disease, which is group three here, which had two or more vessels with significant coronary artery stenosis, had a much greater risk of death um, after kidney transplant than patients who um, did not have significant coronary disease. When they broke this down to look at patients who were transplanted versus not transplanted, you can see even in group three, so this is patients with severe coronary disease, patients who got a transplant were statistically much more likely to have long-term survival than patients who weren't transplanted. So I think it's very important that we try to do the best by people and clearly we can't transplant everybody and clearly there are more people wanting a transplant and needing a transplant than there are organs available. But precluding people from transplant isn't always beneficial for them. So what about patients who we know have significant coronary disease or who are having a coronary artery event? So we suggest that candidates who have a myocardial infarction be assessed by a cardiologist to determine whether further testing is warranted and when they can safely proceed with kidney transplantation. We also suggest that transplantation be delayed an appropriate amount of time after placement of coronary stent as recommended by the patient's cardiologist. So having a myocardial infarction, we know that um, mortality is high in patients having surgery after a recent MI. Postoperative mortality um, at patients less than one month post-MI is about 33%. But if you bring out an operation to 90 to 100 day, 180 days post-MI, the risk is much lower. Now, obviously, these statistics are not in the end-stage renal failure population. However, I think it is very sensible to not transplant somebody if they've just had a myocardial infarction and to seek cardiology advice as to when it would be appropriate to put these people back on the transplantation waiting list. And as we all know, kidney transplantation is not really an acute emergency procedure and most people can be dialysed and wait until it's safer for them to have a kidney transplant. In addition, modern medicine now commonly revascularizes acutely patients who are having a myocardial infarction, and often this is with angioplasty and stenting. And so when we place a coronary artery disease, uh, a stent in a coronary artery, um, patients are usually on dual antiplatelet therapy, so aspirin plus another antiplatelet agent such as clopidogrel. The difficulty with this is that there is a significantly increased risk of bleeding, and the reason people are put on dual antiplatelet therapy is to reduce um, acute instant restenosis um, and acute cardiac events. So the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy is changing in the cardiac literature. Currently, if you have a bare metal stent, they're recommending that you have at least one month on dual antiplatelet therapy. If you have a drug eluting stent, it tends to be six to 12 months, but those numbers are coming down. So for that reason, we've recommended that discussing it with your cardiologist and looking at cardiac guidelines is most helpful. And certainly in our department, in patients who have a drug eluting stent, we now just wait six months after the procedure, then stop the clopidogrel and then transplant the patient just on aspirin. And we've had good success with that um, strategy. 
So this is looking at the American Cardiology College of Cardiology American Heart Association guidelines published about five, six years ago. And this is what they suggest to do for patients with coronary stents. And um, essentially, it's waiting for a period of time in patients with a drug-eluting stent. And in this guideline, they tend to talk about waiting for 365 days or a year with a drug-eluting stent, but 30 days for bare metal stents. And then looking at stopping one of the agents, if that's possible, and being able to do the procedure. The difficulty with doing a transplant in a patient on dual antiplatelet therapy is that obviously they'll be much more oozy during the procedure, but also most people would say that it's really not okay to do a biopsy in patients who are on dual antiplatelet therapy, and so that makes post-operative management more difficult as well. So patients with on dialysis and with end-stage renal failure also have other cardiac problems, and one of these is pulmonary hypertension. So we've written some guidelines about pulmonary hypertension because this is quite common in patients who are on dialysis. So we suggest that asymptomatic candidates who've been on dialysis for at least two years or have risks for pulmonary hypertension, such as portal hypertension, a connective tissue disorder, congenital heart disease, or COPD, undergo echocardiography. And patients with an estimated pulmonary systolic pressure greater than 45 by echo should have an assessment by a cardiologist. And we recommend that patients with severe pulmonary hypertension that you haven't managed to correct by, say, offloading fluid um, should have a right heart cath or should be considered for a right heart cath in order to accurately assess their pulmonary um, artery pressure. We don't recommend completely excluding patients with pulmonary hypertension, but the risks of sudden deterioration or progression after transplantation need to be considered when you look at estimated survival. So this is some work um, which looks at the event rate and the risk of death in patients with pulmonary hypertension compared with patients who do not have pulmonary hypertension. And you can see that there's an increased risk of death in pulmonary hypertension patients and an increased risk in cardiovascular events. Um, and so from that perspective, there's this discussion about looking to do a heart cath to try and actually accurately assess the degree of pulmonary hypertension in order to see how that can be managed and improved, perhaps so you can get your patient on the transplant list. And we do know that echo assessments of pulmonary hypertension are not always completely accurate. This is some work that we've done uh, looking at patients with severe pulmonary hypertension. And you can see here that in comparison with patients who have got normal right heart pressures in, um, on echocardiography, patients with moderate or severe pulmonary hypertension have a much increased uh, risk of death. And uh, that's at least, that's around double compared with patients who do not have pulmonary hypertension. So pulmonary hypertension and right heart problems are of concern, but also left heart failure is quite common, in particular in patients with severe fluid overload. So we have written guidelines about that also. We suggest that patients with uncorrectable symptomatic uh, New York Heart Association Class 3 or 4 heart disease um, be excluded from kidney transplantation unless there are mitigating factors that give the patient a survival that is acceptable according to national standards. In addition to that, because some of these patients may be suitable for a combined heart-kidney transplant, we also suggest that patients with severe heart failure who are otherwise suitable for kidney transplantation should be assessed by a cardiologist for that. So when we look at uh, ejection fraction, and again, this is the work that Liz Storworthy in our department did, you can see that patients with severely impaired LV function, this is an ejection fraction of less than 30%, uh, have a much greater risk of uh, dying. This is all patients who were being assessed for kidney transplantation. 
Um, and this, again, looks at our work that's older, but looking at patients who were being also assessed for kidney transplantation, and it's a similar cutoff. So an ejection fraction of less than 30% really is associated with a much increased risk of death. What about medications? So the statement we've made about medications is suggesting that maintenance aspirin, beta blockers and statins be continued while the patients are on the waiting list and perioperatively according to local cardiac guidelines. As we all know, there are a few studies in chronic kidney disease or end-stage kidney disease looking at cardiac medications and the general guidelines do recommend continuing cardioprotective medications in the perioperative period. So these statements are from the European Society and American Society guidelines, where both sets of guidelines recommend perioperative beta blocker therapy and perioperative statin therapy if the patient is already on those agents. And I think that's a sensible thing to do if people have got known coronary disease. In addition, if people are on aspirin, they should remain on aspirin. So we've written some guidelines and obviously things may change. We do believe that this is an area where further research will be important and have made some recommendations about ongoing studies. So we believe that randomised controlled trials should be conducted to look at the costs and benefits um, and harms of non-invasive cardiac testing of coronary artery disease in patients being assessed for kidney transplantation. I think the CASC study will be very helpful from that perspective. We believe that ongoing studies looking at revascularization versus optimal medical management will be important. And obviously, ischemia CKD has not been published, but the early assessments of that study and analyses suggest that our guideline suggesting that patients should not be exclusively revascularised just to get a tr kidney transplant seem to be valid. We believe that looking at valid prediction scores for survival after kidney transplantation should be encouraged, and these should include combinations of cardiac uh, comorbidities. And also, because pulmonary hypertension is such a problem, we would be interested in studies examining the efficacy of treatment options for pulmonary hypertension in patients with end-stage kidney disease. So I might leave this slide up uh, as the last slide. And many thanks again for asking me to talk on this issue. And it's been a great privilege for me to be involved with the KDGO guidelines. Thanks very much. Helen, thanks very much for a uh, truly state-of-the-art walk, walk through and approach to the evaluation of the kidney transplant candidate from a cardiovascular perspective. We have a large number of people online. I hope that you all found this a useful talk and I would strongly encourage you to type any questions that have come to mind. Certainly a number have come to me, but I'd firstly like to kick off with questions, Helen, from one of our great colleagues from Canada, Greg Knoll has typed in a question relating to the Delima patient, uh, Delima key heart study that you mentioned where patients were stratified looking at entry to the kidney transplant waiting list on the basis of their cardiovascular risk. And Greg wanted to know whether those deemed to be at low risk were submitted to a cardiac echo prior to listing. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Greg. I think that's a really good question. My understanding is that those patients did not specifically have to have a cardiac echo um, if they were low risk. However, what? that's a very good question, and I can't, I couldn't 100% guarantee that. But my understanding is I don't think they did. Certainly in our group, um, in patients who are low risk, we don't mandate an echo in the low risk patients who have not been on dialysis for uh, long. So for example, in our group, if you were a 30 year old with uh, glomerulonephritis as the cause of your kidney disease, who had no cardiac symptoms, who'd been on dialysis for a year, we would not mandate an echo. Thanks, Helen. And along very similar lines, we've had a second question from Dr. Ng, um, seeking, um, your interpretation of when, according to an echo, the extent of fra ejection fraction reduction 
um, should be seen as a contraindication to transplantation. Do you so, have a cut point? I Sure. Yeah, I think that's a really good question also. So our cut point is 30%, an ejection fraction of 30%. Um, the reason for that is in every study that you look at, a, an ejection fraction of 30% or, or under 30% is associated with significant uh, morbidity and mortality. There is a caveat on that, though, and so what we do is if somebody's got a poor ejection fraction, we up their dialysis. We are very careful to be sure that the patient gets down to a good dry weight. We're very vigorous about fluid removal. We look at treatments such as carvedilol, which have been shown in some studies to be beneficial, and there, there is there are a couple of studies looking at carvedilol in the end-stage kidney disease population. And what we often find is with good fluid removal and a bit of beta blocker, patients' ejection fractions will improve substantially. So we would not say never in somebody who's got a poor LV. We would dialyse them vigorously, get rid of fluid and reassess the situation. And often those people will have a substantial improvement in coronary uh, in uh, ejection fraction and be able to be transplanted. And in fact, just this week, we've transplanted somebody, somebody in that very situation whose ejection fraction has improved from 15% up to normal just with fluid removal. Helen, um, I think we've all had those patients, particularly young people who struggle with their fluid control on dialysis and have, have an ejection fraction less than 30%. And despite all that we can do in a bid to improve their dialysis and cardiac performance with cardioactive drugs, just can't get them above 30%, but they're asymptomatic and otherwise suitable. How do you manage that situation? So I think what we do is if they're otherwise well and at low risk, so as you say, the young person, you know, maybe with an ejection fraction of 25% um, that you just can't get up, we would look at transplanting those people because there's a reasonable chance that those people will actually get improvement in their cardiac function when they've got a kidney that functions and when they're kind of uvolemic for long periods of time. So we would not necessarily preclude them. These guidelines of kind of looking again at um, the the risks, and I think you need to look at the whole patient rather than just one specific thing. Helen, in the guidelines, you've looked at the evidence underpinning several of the non-invasive stress tests, nuclear tests, stress echoes, and treadmills. What yeah. do you do clinically? Do you see any difference between them, and do you have a difference according to patient phenotype? That's, again, a really good question. So what we do in our department is we do a dobutamine stress echo and, um, or an exercise stress echo. So our cardiologists prefer an exercise stress echo if the patient is able to exercise. But as you know, many patients with end-stage renal failure and in our uh, population in New Zealand, we have a very high proportion of patients with diabetes who are obese, many of whom have got some degree of vascular disease, and to be honest, they just can't exercise. So I think it really depends on the expertise of the department. So the studies have all shown that the um, predictive value of these tests is all pretty similar. So what we do is dobian mean stress echo or exercise stress echo. A lot of groups do some sort of myocardial perfusion study. I think coronary angiography can be done, but obviously it's invasive. There are some studies looking at a CT coronary angiography. And again, the difficulty, I think, with a CT coronary angiogram or just a standard coronary angiogram is that it, it's also helpful to know what LV function is like. So you probably need to do an echo as well, unless they can do a um, ventriculogram when they do the coronary angiogram. I think an 
exercise tolerance test. So just putting somebody on a treadmill and doing a sort of straight ECG exercise tolerance test is probably not very predictable. We know even in the normal population in women that it's not a very predictable test, particularly if people are asymptomatic. And studies have looked at that and shown that patients can really exercise to a good enough capacity to make that a useful test in the end-stage kidney disease population. But I think people should really just go with the expertise of their cardiology department when looking for the best fit for a cardiac stress test in their group. Excellent. Um, we still have a few minutes remaining, so if anybody has any residual questions, please do type them, up, type them in. In the meantime, Helen, could I give you a scenario? Um, let's say we have a scenario of a 60 years old man who was an ex-smoker and uh, you submit them to a stress echo, which is abnormal. You then yep. move on to coronary angiography, which shows two yep. vessel disorders, 70% stenosis in the right coronary, 70% circumflex. He's completely asymptomatic. How would you manage that scenario? So 70% circumflex, 70% um, right. Right. And they're right. 60, are, they, are they diabetic? Non-diabetic, 60 years of age, quit smoking yep. five years ago, 20-pack yep. year history. So we would uh, – I'm assuming this person has satisfactory uh, LV function and no, not severe pulmonary hypertension. If Correct. that was a case, right, we would uh, put them on some aspirin if they weren't on aspirin. We would uh, get them to see a cardiologist who would probably recommend that they were on a beta blocker if they weren't on a beta blocker. And we would transplant that person. Excellent. Thank you. Um, in the absence okay, of any further... Can I, can I just do? add... Yeah that we would also transplant that person if they were diabetic. So, um, you know, we, we um, as, as many people will know, in New Zealand we have a predictive score uh, that looks at patients and um, a diabetic at, of 60 years old who had known coronary disease, even if it weren't revascularised, so long as there was no survival benefit and revascularization, we would we would transplant. Gotcha. Helen, I think that brings along another interesting concern we've had in generating the guidelines, which is that you've presented an approach to cardiac disease in isolation and other chapters of our guideline will address other aspects of, of the patient diabetic status, pulmonary status, whether they have other comorbidities. What I think clinicians have the task of doing is putting all of those bits together for their individual patient to ultimately determine candidacy. I'm interested to hear that in New Zealand you have an algorithm. Do you think that that is a useful way to determine overall risks and potential benefits of transplantation and therefore guide you in your decision about whether you make this candidate active or not? Yeah, that's, it, it's a very interesting point. And in New Zealand, I think this has been extremely useful. We have three transplant units in the country. We have quite a variety of uh, comorbidity of patients in different units. So in Auckland, where I work, we have a very high proportion of patients with vascular disease, diabetes and obesity. Um, and that differs according to areas in the country. And what we're lucky, we're a small country and we all get on, which I think is, is helpful. And so what we agreed to do on a national level was to do a predictive score. And the score that we use is based on Greg Knowles' uh, study that he published a number of years ago, I think in the Canadian Medical Journal, where um, a score or a, a, a kind of algorithm was made uh, and looked at patients' comorbidity. And so we 
it's not perfect. We look at whether they're diabetic or not. We look at age, which is a predictive factor for mortality. We look at presence of significant vascular disease, including a cerebral artery uh, vascular disease, coronary disease, LV function, severe uh, chronic obstructive airways disease, presence or absence of smoking, duration of dialysis, and uh, a bunch of other factors, including serum albumin. And a score is generated for the patient, and everyone in the country has the same cutoff. And what that has meant is uh, there's a transparent process. I think there's uh, equity for patients in terms of you don't get a better deal at one unit than another unit. So I think that's also very good. I think it means that we're able to tell patients uh, why they may not be accepted on the deceased donor list. I should also state, though, that uh, this doesn't preclude people 100% from transplantation. So if somebody had a poor score but was otherwise suitable to get a transplant, i.e. we think that they will actually survive the procedure and get a period of time where they're better off being transplanted, then it wouldn't preclude them necessarily from a living donor transplant. So it's, this is purely looking at the deceased donor list. Obviously, if we had organs for everybody, we would just give organs to everybody. So th the issue is about uh, trying to manage in the most responsible and equitable and transparent way the number of organs that we have available for transplantation balanced against the much larger number of patients who need a kidney transplant. Helen, thank you. I think that's a fantastic insight into how to approach use of guidelines and also a tremendous walk through the approach to cardiovascular assessment prior to transplant. Uh, I'd now like to close, but I'd like to raise three points. Firstly, to thank very much our speaker, Helen Pilmore, and also thank all of the audience for your interaction and your involvement. I hope you found this useful. Secondly, to say, please be on the lookout for the publication of the KDGO kidney candidacy guidelines, which will come out any week now in transplantation and will hopefully be useful in your clinical practice. And thirdly, to advertise our next webinar, which is booked for May 5. This will be a fa fascinating webinar hosted by Greg Knoll from Canada, the discussant being Jermaine Wong from Westmead in Sydney, who's going to talk about cancer and the kidney transplant candidates. On that note, I'd like to close. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you next time.